Hello, this is John, uh, today known as Spore, and I'm going to be showing you a little bit of how I work inside FL Studio. Welcome. <laughs> So um, a sort of mainstay staple of uh, jungle and drum and bass would be the Amen break. It's been used tens of thousands of times, as I'm sure you're all aware. And uh, I stumbled across a paper where um, a research institute had separated uh, parts of the drums, uh, or at least tried to. So I thought it'd be fun to play with, uh, just because they're sort of open source, I guess, um, at this point. I opened that up and messed around with how I could gain any advantage with how clear I can make the whole kit using that. So um, here are the pieces I'm going to show you. This is a rough project that I've used purely to make a break. So. so here we've got the Amen brought into a loop. And I should be able to isolate So using some sort of like noise cancelling software, they've managed to pull these apart and they've got the kick. And then the hat ride. I found this pretty interesting. You can hear how much of the character is in, especially the, the, the hat ride on this. So then it was a case of EQing as much of the sort of irrelevant information out of each of these channels as I could without losing the character because I think a lot of this is the balance is if you start stripping these things really down it's not an amen anymore you're not going to get the feel of the original break so I was trying to be cautious with how aggressive I was but at the same time get an engineering advantage because in drum and bass transients need to be fast and clear the track is fast it's running quickly it's a high bpm you've got less time to get your information across and when you're dealing with a lot of low end, you're dealing with a speaker that uh, if you ask too much of it, uh, like a sub bass speaker, it's not going to keep up with very complex information. So I'm looking for clear, fast transients that will be transmitted through big, slow speakers, effectively. Uh, stuff that isn't as responsive as your monitor uh, on a club level. So what I'm, the next stage was to, uh, firstly, I EQ'd out away what was not necessary. You can see I got rid of most of the kick here. There's a big a lot of information here, but it's it's messy and it, there's more than one sort of there's a lot of harmonics going on basically. So the kick was the least useful to me except keeping the amount that I would have defined as character, brightening it up a bit. The snare channel. But what I'm doing here is the same thing, I'm trying to level out the uh, the response and, uh, and get a cleaner signal from what's happening. Quite a lot of high boost on that as well. There's some, there's some like mess up here, but I wasn't worried about it at this point. And then the hat ride, same thing. So I'm looking at uh, leveling out the response so it's not too heavy in any particular area, just getting a cleaner signal across the board. Uh, and then the next stage was to look at the actual uh, sort of fundamentals of each drum and try and match it. So I have a, uh, a patch for that that I made a while ago. So this is a, sounds very simple. It's just noise and using a sign and some envelopes basically, and then a bit of effects to uh, make a very rudimentary drum, but a drum where I've got complete control over the length of the transient and therefore how long it hangs around in the track. So then the next point is to was basically to pitch this to match as precisely as possible. You can see I've gone here on the on the tune in. So that when this plays, we're able to line it up with the transient that your ear is expecting in the original Amen snare. Okay, so having cleaned up the Amen break stems and removed most of the fundamentals of the drums, but having made a note of where they are, uh, I then set about getting these serum drums. And a, and a kick to line up with those, thus giving me basically more control over how long they're around. So to give an example, here's the, the snare uh, prior. And then by tuning that serum patch to exactly this uh, fundamental, 
now it's landing in exactly the same spot. So I'm bringing the two frequency spectrums on top of each other here, and you can basically what I was doing is tuning my synthetic drum with the recorded one, and then by repeating that process, So I've now got these like very tiny and they're very sort of harmonically transparent. It's basically just noise and the fundamental and a couple of distort, uh, harmonics provided by the distortion in the patch. But it, it gives a very simplistic drum uh, that I can shorten right down and have a lot of control over its envelopes. And the same with the kick, I'm running a very short one. Uh, but it's trying to match the frequency of the original. Uh, and then by combining that all together, Hopefully now you've got a, a combination of, you know, the character of the original Amen break, and now I've got a situation where I've got much cleaner transients within it. Uh, I've kept the original rhythm of it and everything because I didn't really want to mess. Like so much of the break is the, is the swing inherent inside it. Uh, it took me a long time to realize that in production, actually. The, the, I was not naturally focused on the rhythm, but uh, anyway, I didn't want to mess with that. So we've, you know, I hand sequenced these to line up with you what was there originally. Uh, and then a bit of treatment on the master uh, to compress and distort and just see how much I could squeeze out of it. But then what I also do, this is basically an export patch. So what I'm making is something that's a blank canvas to use elsewhere. So I don't want to get too extreme with how I treat it on the way out. I want to leave it lots of headroom. I like leaving a lot of dynamics and stuff. I'm not there to like, you're not going to see me like red line the limit the master or anything like I'm not into it um so all together Oops. I've then got a situation where I've got a track I can uh a sample I'm, I can then bounce out uh you might see uh over on the left here I organize by month every month I make a folder everything I make that month goes into that folder and I can go back many, many years. Uh, there's, some of them are full of junk. Some of them are 500 takes of a guitar that I couldn't get right. But nonetheless, in it goes. And it's, for me, that's been a way of organizing. Unless I do a specific thing like this, sometimes I'll, I'll spend a whole day making crash symbols or putting huge echoes on effects and uh, they can go in their own folders. But this has been a, an interesting and consistent way for me to work so far so there you go right now i'm going to move over to the main project that i used this on so then having made this i got inspired and i tried to quickly sketch down a track uh with this as the backbone all right so i brought things over to the actual track that i sketched out using the the break that i made in the separate project uh, i was working very quickly with this i wanted to sketch something down i had a very specific idea in my head at the time. I'd also just picked up this Novation Summit as basically my main MIDI and you know a nice outboard thing to make patches on. So the track started with dropping in a couple of breaks and messing around. So down here I recorded some stems of me patching this uh, seeing what I could come up with. So I made a few patches in it and then one of them I ended up just using an intro here. Uh, also, I wanted to try and focus on resampling as sort of a feature of the track. I was trying to carry through a sort of modernization of an old school feel. So I wanted clean transients, technical present presentation, but using sort of old school and rudimentary techniques. So making sure I sort of bounce things into audio, things like that. So actually some of that I'm gonna to continue to do in this track. Uh, this is not finished and I ain't got a name. But I thought that would be more interesting to show you something that, you know, I could have sat here and polished a track up and been like, this is how I always work. But uh, I don't think that's very honest. So, uh, this is really how things go. So uh, this has got some nice unison uh, sort of saw wave capability, fun thing to use. Uh, so I set up a few reasons on it, one of which is this. A 
couple other in here. This is a nice thing to work on. Yes, the summit's been a fun thing to work on. You can do some interesting thing with bending the oscillators different amounts uh, off the one wheel. This is a fairly straightforward, old school sounding Reese as far as I'm concerned. Just trying to get a crunchy, complex, uh, undulating sound. Uh, and I recorded in, uh, I think the track's in G sharp minor, recorded in a... Uh, and then I also incorporated that with some old school stabs I had tucked away in a folder from many, many years ago. I absolutely love the Fruity Sampler. I think that's one of its, from the beginning, one of the best ideas they ever had is having this f fully functional, very low CPU usage sampler that loads, you know, you just drag a sample in, it loads in this. It's already fully featured. Other programs I've used, you sort of have to set up the situation. And that discovering that later always seemed like making you jump through unnecessary hoops. Uh, for me, this is just a brilliant solution because it gives you maximum control over anything in your project at any time. There's no excuse for not being able to manipulate uh, in lots of different ways any sound that you've already got in. You don't have to go and put it into you know, a, a third party pl uh, sampler or load up a specific sampler within the DAW that has that feature set because it's missing from a base uh, installation of a sound. So I've dropped in a couple of stabs here. When you've got a sampled chord in those old stabs, that part of the effect of that old school effect is basically when you're playing that sampled chord on a back on a sequencer, you're moving the whole chord, you know, in its inversion up and down with no changes. So you get some interest in shifts which are very to me they're very evocative of a time in dance music where samplers were you know that was the way things were done so love that sound and that's how the intro is built and then down here i've got a think break absolutely raw just in it in it goes uh, with a little eq and then i'm also running another similar situation that i had before where I'm, I'm just boosting the transient using the uh, ever faithful uh, FL Studio default snare here yeah? and I'm using it in a way where I'm providing a tiny sort of puff of transient and noise uh, there's a specific reverb on there to, to give it a slight tail mixing in tracks from the start especially in drum and bass you want to be able to pick up things in your headphones when you're trying to bring it in that are going to help you align it with what you're trying to mix into so it's important to have a metronomic effect in the intro and then the creative solution is doing that in a way that doesn't just sound like you banged a loud hi-hat over the intro uh, for a DJ. So trying to find things to make your ear grab onto while also sounding congruous. So by holding shift, moving the mouse wheel, I'm capable of just selecting and shifting the timing on these. And uh, it's rare you'll hear piano, you know, piano keys across the octave played exactly at the same time. Putting a little flam on the on the way that the notes are presented. Uh, there, there's a couple of ways of doing that in here, but seeing as it's only two notes just spread on an octave here. That's by far the most efficient. Um, but what a nice feature, you know, just roll them all across, move the time in. Just uh, adds a little bit of character to it. De like humanizing MIDI is always important. I think that applies across the board, especially working in a DAW. Uh, if you're adding delays, I would always recommend trying to slightly adjust the delay, even if it's time synced, trying to delay it slightly off. Perfect. Uh, you're going to end up with more opportunity for interesting things to happen basically rather than perfect digital reproduction in a, a lot of delays will, will be adding this in for you now but i think it's good practice to try and study 
whether stuff's coming back to you perfectly. And once those things stack up across a track, it just becomes a nicer place to be. So combined intro. I'm always coming back to the root note here, just trying to build tension. I haven't got any riser noises in anything yet. It's just sort of pulling the bass out. Go up an octave on the summit. So there's the drop. Uh, you can hear there's different uh, sort of levels of dynamics going on within that, different amounts of bass. It's pretty level, but this isn't a finished track. So I've got the master chain turned off. You're just hearing it as it's coming out. Uh, there's a couple of things to note in the intro here. Uh, the way the sum is presented, I've got it running. So I've got little pieces of the audio just looped. I sort of chopped into the stuff I played and treated it as if it was sort of a you know like a remix almost and just took the pieces i liked the best pitch bends i'd done and lined them all up produced a horrible amount of artifacts in the low end but i'd eq all that out most of it and then um the most important part was just before the drop like trying to get that feeling of things cycling up i'm trying to reduce down the time everything's playing and so i the last note i just repeated the audio <laughs> So you get that sort of drum roll effect off that. I was trying to get as much tension into each element without just resorting to a huge roll of kicks or a massive wind up. Getting the actual music to play the, the tension is, is always more gratifying. It's more memorable as well. So I, I, would, I would say that's a good practice. If you listen to tracks you like, even if they've got kick rolls and they've got big rise vengeance sounds in them and stuff, even if they're there, imagine them without and say, is the track actually, is the writing of the track, if I play this back on piano, is it making me feel tension? Is it developing? Or have they just looped a chord and added all those effects? And if you take them away, there's actually nothing there. I think the best tracks you'll find, the tension is written into the chords or, the, or at least the, the notes and the way they're being sustained. Uh, so that's what I'm, I'm trying to do a bit of that here. Uh, and then here we got like the first part So you can hear there's a lot of reverb tails on there. Here's the drum loop. The break that we looked at in the first project, here it is being used. I've dropped it into the, the original Fruity Slicer, as it's still called. Um, I absolutely love this thing. They have a newer version. I still use this. There's probably someone in the comments like, why? I just find this, I love the workflow of this. It's so simple, but effective. If you've come in on a, off axis, you can, you can trim that out. You can move the slices around, you can remove them. You can change an auto slice feature and shift where it's trying to look for the transients. Lovely thing. I've used this in hundreds of tracks and ideas now. You've got individual envelope control, of course, because it's basically just a plug-in on the front of the original sampler. So that, I dropped that into here to give me specific control. So now I've got the samples, the pieces of the Amen that I'd made, all split up down the side, ready to go. And then I could decide how much quantized to apply to it. You can see how far off it is. I made a point of not correcting that, as long as the main points are on beat. You know that snare has got like a, a pre-transient on it, which is something I love in production. I'd say it's been a sort of feature of my music for years. Is this piece here, you're sort of emulating what happens with a compressor when it's being way overworked. Like the sort of look ahead is creating this exponential rise in amplitude before the transient hits and you get this sort of reverse effect. And that little flick, I think, is, adds a lot of effect to sounds. It's quite a specific sound, but I think there's something very satisfying and gluing about it. So I try and preserve it if it's there. You won't see me chopping that off unless I'm going for a very, I guess, robotic sound, I suppose, or, or more like drum machine feel. With drum bass, that's not really me. So there's the loop. It looks like I've added in a couple more transients to move things around. This one's just adding the tops. Uh, the other thing I'm doing here is while I'm working on drum and bass or any loud dance music, I'll have a way of separating mid and side. One thing I don't want to happen is that all the tops, which can happen quite easily if you're using a lot of reverb to create your drums and stacking and things. When you're listening back, 
when you're listening back, you don't want all your top end to be contained in the side signal so that when you play the track in mono, the drums sound sort of dull. So it's worth checking. I want an interesting side signal, but I don't want it ultra bright, personally. I want to make sure that the focus of the transients, like where you pick out the edges of the sounds, is concentrated in the, in the mid signal. So it combines to make, you know, there's a lot of clarity. I know that it stands up to a mono presentation, but the side is bringing in character. There's interesting stuff in the side. There's no crazy bass in the side or anything like that. This whole drum kit and the Eamon and Dremel is pretty light on low end if you EQ it right. So there's that combination. You can see here, I've got quite a lot of rooting going on with these. So I love FL's mixer for the amount of rooting that's capable of. I don't think anyone else has got close with how capable this is now. With adjustable sends, you can root out pretty much as many as you like. And now you can root those all back into something which feeds even back into itself. And it doesn't seem to come up against any horrible latency issues. They, they seem to patch all that out over the years. So I've never had so much opportunity in, in terms of sends I can run. I've got a send here for like a global reverb on the drum to try and bring them all in together. And I've got a send out here for a distortion, which is running very low, sort of like a parallel effect. So having a, a crunched up version of the drum kit layered back on itself and then having individual control, how much can I bring that in? So you can hear I've got some like incidental sound going on. Just a, like a ting. I always loved that in Prodigy and stuff. There'd be like metallic noises in the background, stuff whipping around. It just sounds aggressive, like while you're listening to the drummer, there's a, another person there with just hitting a pipe. <laughs> in my mind, that sounds high energy. And then because this is a different pitch of Amen, I've got a different... I've got a different transient associated with it to get it to work. Obviously, as I've pitched this down, I've shifted the transient that's in that recording, and I wanted to accentuate that. I was finding that compared to the other kit I'd made, there was too much of a drop in how, the, how defined that was. So, um... so a similar process, these are all running in FL Slicer at different pitches. This one, I was having a bit of trouble with the snare, so I pulled it straight out of the slicer into a new sampler, just bang, on it went. And that gave me a little bit more control over it. I was able to fade out the end here slightly. If you hold control when you move a wheel in FL, you can adjust it finely. And I was, I was playing very slightly with the amount of pre-transient here. Basically, it was, it was conflicting with the transient in my other snare, the Serum one here. And I'm always looking for phase alignment in, in between drums in FL. So if you've got you know, the waveform of your synthetic snare going up first, and then uh, you've got the sampled one going down, if those frequencies you know, are the same, they're gonna cancel each other out. You're gonna get uh, phase cancellation. And so by adjusting the, the starting position of the samples, you can sometimes hit the point where they correlate rather than cancel and uh, that could, I've always found that can produce interesting effects. I was actually doing that in FL before I really realized there are other ways of doing it uh, just by using the reverse polarity button so you just, you're just you know instantly flipping this thing over. I would say it's an interesting exercise put a bunch of drums in line them all up in the sequencer and play with just reversing the polarity and you, you might be surprised at how different of a sound is generated sometimes depending on where the frequency be, frequencies are being doubled or removed. The reverbs are providing a tail so that when this thing stops, it doesn't just stop into a vacuum, um, which I think jars your ear sometimes, unless you specifically want that effect of everything absolutely stopping. I've left the tail just carrying slightly into the space. Just so there's that lift off, it, to me that's slightly more, it's more natural sounding. You wouldn't just have that instant stop, which is much more indicative to me of, uh, of uh, sampling over drumming. And I'm trying to sit somewhere in the middle here. This is a, the main sound, you probably want to hear it quickly. Huge tail on it. This is supposed to be huge. Um, I'm still not really finished with it. What I'm basically doing is running out 
there's a low end for it. And then I'm running out, it doubled. So I've got one accentuate in the low end. This is a bit of a messy way of doing things. And then I've doubled the sound out here. And then this one I'm distorting more. Reverb, I've got a delay before the distortion, reverb after, and it's stripped right back. So this is the only area that's being left behind. So it's not inflicting on this right over here. I didn't need this part of the track to be ultra bassy. Um, I think the tendency for people is to want the first hit of the drop to have all the bass. But in this one, that first bar is supposed to almost sound like a little wind up, you know, sort of like spinning your arm back. And the next section brings more low end. So I'm trying to level up and down the amount of bass. Also in the inherent writing of the track, there's a consistent pattern, which is something actually I learned from Noisier a long time ago. It's like, if you are gonna make a very complex drum and bass song, like I, I would always spread all my patterns. I, I would want a new pattern every time when I very first started producing. And the track ends up like, like jazz. You're, you're, just, you're just leading someone down a sort of uh, stream of consciousness, really. You're changing as you feel the music needs to change but you end up with something that never really repeats. There's no consistent factor from one bar to the next. And I think that that can be great, but if you're getting, trying to get people who are probably, for one reason or another, not 100% with you in a crowded, noisy environment, if you're trying to get something pretty complex across, it's good to have one unifying rhythm throughout. So each bar in this, and the intro as well, all represents the same rhythm. So if I play the beginning, It's kick, snare. And that's represented also in the hits of the piano. So everything represents this rhythm. And then that's, so that's, to me, that primes your mind to hear that again once the drop happens, so. So that consistently runs through all the way. Um, and uh, that to me was a way, once I established that through the track, it, it makes adding more elements a lot easier. You've got that framework and you can think, well, whatever I want to happen in a new section of the track, sticking to that pattern is gonna make the person understand why it's there, even if it's a dramatically different sound or whatever. It's, to me, that's a, a, a nice unification. So I've got some simple sub here and then. This is, uh, so I used to work a lot resampling and uh, so this is a resampled 808 basically running through an incredible amount of distortion. I would basically just keep adding different paths and I had a couple of, you know, I've got a couple of distortion presets that I would run things through and stack up to create uh, an 808 based bass which I could then manipulate back in the fruity sampler and I think this is a sound that people I've seen people reverse engineer this effect within a synthesizer which is sort of counterintuitive to me because it's it's complicating what was originally a pretty simple idea it's like I have this complicated sound in this case it's a I used to call them buzz smacks with my mate Martin when we started so a sort of slang term for a massively distorted 808. I think I was modeling this on the I was trying to replicate the one in Hornet by Bad Company, uh, which always, it had such a nice pop to the front. It was obviously a kick drum. So this is, a, this is one of those run through lots and lots of times to get the distortion right, adjusting the tone between the distortions or before uh, to get the right amount. And then Fruity's got the lovely use loop points feature. So bang, you don't, I don't have to do this to the party. It will just add them in for me. I think in this case, I added them in here and here, you can do that in Edison. Uh, and then I'm allowed to crossfade them with this dial. So I'm now fading the end back into the start. And now instead of terminating here, it's gonna keep playing. Great, right, so now I've got an actual consistent bass. And the other advantage of that, which sounds very drum and bass to me, is that when you pitch, obviously this distance shortens. So we go up an octave, it's gonna repeat twice as quickly. So that to me is like 
classic drum and bass sound to, to do that with Reese's and everything. And originally it was a, it was a limitation of the sampler, you know, um, it was just going around faster, but it brings with it a feeling of acceleration and that's pretty satisfying. That said, this one I dropped into Serum as like a wavetable just to give some interesting control over it. And so this is the, just. So you can see I've got these like sub-rooted. I tend to like organize my, my uh, track and more, the more random something gets, the further to the right it goes. With the bass stuff, I'm watching it come in. I'm trying to get the levels as close off the mixer channel before I do any uh, restriction with compressors or anything. Uh, I'd like to see re fairly consistent levels from all my sub elements, especially in a track like this where there are lots of them. I'm trying to make them uh, consistent across the board. So once I brought that in, the other way I use it, this is probably my most used native FL thing uh, other than the sampler. And that's just the bass limiter. The reason being, it has a very convenient way of side chaining. So I'm using 3 osc it's just a really simple, you can actually make some great sounds with this. I've tried to make whole tracks with this just as a exercise in how much can you do with something so rudimentary. But what I'm doing here is just creating a little transient with it, which is muted. So if I play it, it's just a little spike. And then I'm using that to mark out like you would do with the MIDI signal to a different sidechain element. I can mark out now with this piece of audio where I want sidechains to happen in other tracks. And so they're running in on this channel. I call it SE Trigger. And so when that plays, there's that, there's the three OSC creating little cuts using the limiter just by bringing it in on a side chain. Side chain to that track and then you bring it in on the side chain. The reason that to me is useful is because you can use that creatively now. Like if I was to move this around. Obviously not useful for this instance, but because I've got specific envelope control of the trigger, I can change how long it sticks around, how long it fades in. You could obviously assign that to anything, a filter, or you could have it moving other things around using the P controller. <laughs> using the P controller, you can link it to almost anything. So a very nice, like baked in way of, uh, of side chaining, which I've always done in drum and bass. I don't know if anybody, everybody does. An extent for me is, is like, creating that ultra compressed feel without actually doing that. So just having, you know, ducking is sort of an inherent effect of over compression and, and uh, things being smushed together. So uh, by stacking that in. There you go, that's sort of how it starts to uh, add a bit of feel. There's not much more to show. I do have a sort of partially effective master chain on here with just some, a little bit of distortion dialed in on parallel, some multiband and some limiting. And then some de facto things I always run on the master is, is a, a way of separating mid and side for quick monitoring. I also have key three monitors here and ATC, SCM 25As and a, a Mixcube Aventone. So I, I wrote uh, while I'm working as well as the on-screen stuff that I've shown you, I'll be rotoring through three sets of monitoring to check uh, how it sounds on an awful speaker, no offense mate, and between these two, which have slightly different presentation. And then the keys allow me through the control to uh, separate mid and side uh, while I'm listening, just with my left hand as well. So I'm constantly referencing the side signal and, and, and concentrate on that. Uh, and that becomes more of a focus as I start moving to the master chain. But I keep this on there just in case. And I've also just got a span, the old one. I know that there's more sophisticated ways of looking at the spectrum. How much I care has been something I'm, I sort of come and go with it. But uh, this, at least while I'm working, gives me a very, very rough view of what's happening with the sound. Check my ears still work basically and uh, yeah, so there's my master and then as, as I work on the track more that will become more in depth but at the moment there's plenty more to write. I've got some ideas for how I want to get a bit more free form towards the second half because uh, I'm, I'm sort of over writing drum and bass where the second half is just the first half pasted across. I don't think that's lazy. <laughs> so and I'm here to write songs. So um, 
that's still to do. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it was some sort of use. I uh, appreciate you coming to the studio and caring enough to watch me work in here. Uh, and thanks to ImageLion for making such a great piece of software, which has more or less defined my life. So, cheers, guys. <laughs>